As I am about to speak of another part of the fifth gospel today, I gain some comfort from the conclusion of John's gospel. You will remember how it says that the gospels certainly do not include all the events that happened around Christ Jesus. For if people had wanted to put it all down at the time, the world would not have contained enough books to hold it all. One thing is beyond doubt, therefore. Other events may also have happened, apart from what is sa- it says in the four Gospels. Today I shall begin to tell stories from the life of Jesus of Nazareth, from about the time we have mentioned on other occasions, when short passages from the fifth Gospel were given. This will provide a basis for everything I really wish to present from the fifth Gospel in these lectures. We will thus begin at the time when Jesus of Nazareth was in about his twelfth year. As you know, that was the year when the Zarathustra, capital I, which had incarnated in one of the two Jesus children who lived at that time, the boy whose origins are given by Matthew, entered through a mystical act into the other Jesus boy, who is especially mentioned at the beginning of Luke's Gospel. We know that the Gospel refers to this moment in the life of Jesus of Nazareth by telling us that the Jesus boy of Luke's Gospel had been lost when going to Jerusalem for the feast day and was found again sitting among the scholars, amazing them and his parents by the tremendous answers he gave. We know however, that those significant, tremendous answers were due to the fact that the Zarathustra eye was truly emerging in the boy, its wisdom working out of this soul from a deep superabundance of memories. We also know that the two families had come together after the mother of the Nathan child and the father of the Solomon child had died and that the Jesus child, who then also bore the Zarathustra eye, grew up in the combined family. The fifth gospel shows that his growing up was strange and unusual. Initially, the people around young Jesus of Nazareth had formed a tremendously high opinion of him because of the significant answers he had given to the scholars in the temple. People saw the future scholar in him someone who would reach a specially high level of scholarship. They had tremendously high hopes of him and began to drink in every word he spoke. In spite of this, the boy grew more and more silent as time went on. He spoke so little that people would often feel uncomfortable when he was around. This happened because he was going through a tremendous inner struggle during the period from about his twelfth to his eighteenth year. It really was as if treasures of wisdom were coming alive in his soul, as if the sun that had once shone as the light of Zarathustra was rising in him, taking the form of Hebrew scholarship. Initially it appeared that the boy was meant to listen with the greatest attention to everything the many scholars who visited his home had to say, and because of his special gifts was always able to answer. He would surprise the scholars who came to the house in Nazareth to gape at the boy wonder. But as time went on, he would be more and more silent, merely listening in silence to what others had to say. Yet great ideas, moral sayings, and great moral impulses arose in his soul during those years. As he listened in silence, the things he heard from the scholars who gathered at the house would make an impression on him but it was an impression that often caused bitterness in his soul. For he felt, please note even in those early years, that everything the scholars said about old traditions and the scriptures of the Old Testament inevitably held much uncertainty and sources of error. Above all, it oppressed his heart to hear how the Spirit used to come upon the prophets of old, how God himself had spoken to inspire them, and how the inspiration had departed from later generations. One thing in particular would make him listen with deep attention 
because he felt this was something that would one day come to him. The scholars would often say, quote, Yes, the sublime and tremendous spirit who came upon Elijah, for instance, speaks no more. Another voice is still speaking. It is weaker, but some, and, and scholars among them, believe they can hear its inspiration coming from the heights of the spirit, something given by the spirit of Yahweh himself. Close quote. They called that strange, inspiring voice the Bath Kol. That's a B-A-T-H, and then another word, K-O-L. This inspiring voice, the Bath Kol, less powerful than the spirit that had inspired the prophets of old, but still something of a similar nature. Some of the people around Jesus would thus speak of the Bath Kol, and later Hebrew writings also tell of her. I am now going to say something which does not really belong here. It is only to explain the Bath Kol. At a slightly later time, when Christianity had already come into existence, a dispute arose between two rabbinical schools. The renowned Rabbi Eliezer ben Hircano established a doctrine, and to prove it he said he was able to work miracles. He made a carob tree rise out of the soil, as it says in the Talmud, and replant itself two hundred feet further away. He made a stream flow backward. And thirdly, he said he received revelations through a voice from heaven, the Bath Kol. In spite of this, people at the school of the Rabbi Joshua did not believe the doctrine. And Rabbi Joshua said, quote, However much Rabbi Eliezer makes carob trees transplant themselves from one place to another, uh, rivers flow uphill, and quotes the great Bath Kol as his authority, it says in the law that the eternal laws of existence must be put into human mouths and human hearts. If Rabbi Eliezer wants to convince us of the truth of his doctrine, he must not claim the authority of the Bath Kol, but must convince us that his teachings are something the human heart can comprehend. Close quote. I am telling this story from the Talmud because it shows that soon after the coming of Christianity, the Bothkol was held in less esteem than before in some rabbinical schools. But in a way it did have its flowering as a voice inspiring both rabbis and scholars. When the young Jesus heard the scholars who had gathered in his home speak of this inspiring voice of the Bath Kol, he would at the same time feel and inwardly receive inspiration through the Bath Kol. The strange thing was that because his soul had been quickened by the Zarathustra eye, Jesus of Nazareth was able to take in everything people around him knew and do so quickly. Not only had he been able to give the scholars those tremendous answers in his twelfth year, but he was able to perceive the Bath Kol in his own heart. Yet it was this inspiration through the Bath Kol that caused such bitter inner struggles for Jesus of Nazareth when he was sixteen or seventeen years of age. The Bath Kol revealed to him, and he was sure of this, that the time was not far off when this spirit would no longer speak the way it had done in the past to the old Jewish teachers who followed the ancient tradition of the Old Testament. One day, and this was a dreadful experience for the soul of Jesus, the Bath Kol revealed to him that it was no longer in touch with the heights where the Spirit could truly reveal to it the truth concerning the future of the Jewish people. That was a terrible moment, a terrible impression received by the soul of the young Jesus, when the Bath Kol itself seemed to reveal to him that it could not continue the revelations of old. It was declaring itself incapable, as it were, of continuing the ancient revelations of Judaism. And Jesus of Nazareth felt that the ground had been taken away from under his feet. There were days when he had to say to himself, all the inner powers I thought I had been given by grace only make me realize that the substance of evolution in Judaism is no longer able to be in touch with the revelations of the Divine Spirit. Let us enter for a moment into the mind and soul of the young Jesus of Nazareth. 
He traveled widely in his sixteenth, seventeenth, and eighteenth years, partly because of his trade and partly for other reasons. His travels took him through many different regions of Palestine and probably also to places outside it. At the time, clairvoyant penetration of the Akashic record shows this very clearly. An Asiatic cult was widespread in the Near East and Southern Europe. It was a mixture of different rites, but predominantly the Mithraic cult. Temples of this cult existed in many places in the different regions. In some places it was more like the cult of Attis, but essentially offerings were made to Mithras and Attis at temples and places of worship everywhere. In a way these were more ancient pagan rites, but the customs and ceremonies of the cults of Mithras and Attis had been mixed in. This spread widely, also to Italy, as is evident from the fact that St. Peter's in Rome stands on a site that was once such a place of worship. Indeed, it was to be, it has to be said, and this may sound offensive to Roman Catholic ears, that in its outer form the ceremonial in St. Peter's and everything connected with it is not at all unlike the ancient cult of Attis, the rites of which used to be performed in the temple which stood on that site. In many respects, the ritual of the Roman Catholic Church is a continuation of the ancient Mithraic cult. Jesus of Nazareth got to know those places of worship in his travels when he was in his 16th, 17th, and 18th years, and also later. We may say that he came to know the inner life of the pagan people by seeing the outer physical evidence. Because of the mighty act in which the Zarathustra I had entered into his soul, he had, naturally, as it were, acquired the high level of clairvoyance which others could only gain by painful effort. When present at the rites, he therefore experienced something different from others who were also there, and there was much that shook him deeply. It may sound fantastic, but I have to stress that when Jesus of Nazareth looked at the offering service performed by a priest at some pagan altar, he would see all kinds of demonic spirits who were attracted by the rite. He also found that some of the idols venerated in those places were not images of good spirits from among the hierarchies, but images of evil demonic powers. He also discovered that those evil powers would often enter into the faithful who were attending the rites. It is easy to understand why these things have not been included in the other Gospels. It really needs the background provided by a spiritual movement like ours if one is to speak of such things. Human souls can only now gain real understanding of the tremendous, profound, and powerful experiences the young Jesus of Nazareth had long before the baptism by John. His travels continued until he was in his twentieth, twenty-second, or twenty-fourth year. He always felt bitterness in his heart when he saw the demons, which were the offspring, as it were, of Lucifer and Araman, and saw that pagan people had often reached the point where they took demons for gods. He saw idols that were images of wild demonic powers that were attracted by those idols and by the rites and would enter into and obsess the people who were saying their prayers in good faith. Those were bitter experiences for him. They came to a conclusion in a way when he was in about his twenty-fourth year. Then an infinitely bitter experience was added to the disappointment he had suffered through the Bath Kol. I have to tell you of this experience Jesus of Nazareth had, but have to add that at present I am not in a position to state exactly where this event took place. I have been able to decipher the scene itself at a high level of accuracy, but am unable to say where it happened. It seems, however, that it happened when Jesus of Nazareth was traveling outside Palestine. I cannot say with certainty 
I cannot say this with certainty, but the scene is one I have to describe. In his twenty-fourth year, Jesus of Nazareth thus came to a pagan place of worship where offerings were made to a particular god. But the people all around were sad and afflicted with all kinds of terrible diseases that affected their souls and also their bodies. The priests had long since deserted the place. Jesus heard the people lamenting that their priests had abandoned them, that the blessings of offering no longer came down upon them, and they had become leprous and sick. It pained him deeply to see their suffering and oppression, and an infinite love for these people arose in his heart. The people who were there must have noticed something of this love. It must have made a deep impression on them as they lamented their abandonment by the priests, and they felt by their gods. And immediately something arising in their hearts made them say in recognition of the infinite love they saw in his face, quote, You are the new priest who has been sent to us. Close quote. They pushed him toward the altar and made him stand on it. He stood there, and they expected and indeed demanded that he should perform the offering service so that the blessings of their God might be theirs again. As the people lifted him onto the altar, he fell down as if dead. His soul was as though transported, and the people who believed their God to have returned witnessed the terrible spectacle of the new priest whom they thought heaven sent falling down as if dead. The soul of Jesus, however, felt itself raised to realms of spirit, as if transported to the realm of sun existence. From the spheres of that existence it heard words sounding which it had formerly often heard through the bath coal. But the bath coal had now been transformed into something entirely different. The voice also came from a different direction now, and what Jesus of Nazareth heard may be summarized, if we translate it into our language, in the words I was able to communicate for the first time when we were laying the foundation stone for our building in Dornach recently. Occult obligations must be met. One of them was that on that occasion I had to communicate what Jesus of Nazareth heard through the changed voice of the Bath Coal at the time of which I am speaking. I have been speaking. He heard the words, Amen, the evils hold sway. Witness of egoity freeing itself. Selfhood guilt through others incurred, experienced in the daily bread. Wherein the will of the heavens does not rule, because man separated himself from your realm and forgot your names, you fathers in the heavens. Readers aside, I will attempt the German here. Amen. Es walten die Übel, Zeugen sich lösende Ichheit, von andern erschuldete Selbstheitsschuld, erlebet in dem täglichen Brote, in dem nicht waltet der Himmel Wille, da der Mensch sich schied von eurem Weicher und vergaß euren Namen, ihr Vetter in den Himmel. I cannot put those words into German in any other way. They are the words the soul of Jesus of Nazareth brought back with it when he regained consciousness. As he turned his eyes again to the crowd of sorely troubled people around him who bore such burdens, the people who had lifted him onto the altar, he found that they had fled. And as he let his clairvoyant eye, E-Y-E, range far afield, he could only direct it to a band of demonic figures, all of which were connected with those people. This was the second significant experience gained at the conclusion of a further develop period of inner development. There was nothing cozy about those experiences, nothing to put the soul into a state of bliss. The soul of Jesus of Nazareth 
had to experience the depths of human nature when still so young, between his twelfth year and the Jordan event. Jesus of Nazareth returned home from this journey at about the time when his father, who had remained at home, died, in about the twenty-fourth year of Jesus' life. When he returned home, the tremendous impression made by the demonic influences that had entered into the old pagan religion was very much alive in his heart. It is always the case that certain levels of higher insight are only gained by getting to know the depths of life. And in a way this was also the case for Jesus of Nazareth, when, somewhere around his twenty-fourth year, he looked deep down into human souls, souls that held a concentration of all the inner miseries humanity could know at that time. Wisdom had deepened for him, but it was like a red-hot iron in his soul. It also made this soul so clairvoyant that it was able to see into the radiant, far-distant reaches of the Spirit. Having heard the voice of the Bath Kol, he was as though transformed, developing the calm, penetrating eye, E-Y-E, that reads the Spirit at a relatively young age. He had become someone who saw deeply into the secrets of life, deeper than anyone on earth, for no one before him had been able to observe the degree of misery that was possible for human beings. First he had seen how people can lose the ground under their feet from mere scholarship. Then he experienced how the inspirations of old were lost. Then he had seen rites and offering services that no longer helped people to relate to the gods, but made all kinds of demons appear who would possess people, causing sickness of soul and body and all kinds of misery. Surely no one on earth had ever seen such depths of misery as Jesus of Nazareth did, and none had responded as deeply in their hearts as he did when he saw the people possessed by demons. Surely no one on earth was more prepared to consider the question, how can an end be put to this misery? Jesus of Nazareth not only had the eye, E-Y-E, and the wisdom of a wise man, but life had also, in a way, made him an initiate. This became known to people who at that time had come together to form an order known the world over as the Essene Order. Essenes had a kind of secret service and secret teachings in some places in Palestine. It was a strict order, Anyone wishing to join had to go through severe trials for at least one, but generally several years. They had to show themselves worthy to be initiated by their demeanor, morals, and dedication to the highest spiritual powers, by their sense of justice and human equality, by disregard for all worldly goods, and so on. Once they had been accepted, they would progress through different degrees to a life of the elect, separate from the rest of humanity, observing strict monastic rules, making special efforts to cleanse themselves, removing anything in body and soul that was not worthy, so that they might approach the world of the Spirit. This is evident from some of the symbolic laws of the Essene order. Deciphering the Akashic record, it has become clear that the name Essene derives from, or at least is connected with, the Hebrew word Essen, E-S-S-I-N, or Asen, A-S-S-I-N. This means something like shovel, small trowel, and the Essenes would always wear a small trowel as a badge, something still seen in some communities or orders today. Their aims also came to expression in certain symbolic acts, They were not allowed to carry coin, nor to go through a gate which was painted or had images in its neighborhood. At the time, the Essene order also enjoyed some degree of external recognition, and special unpainted gates had been built in Jerusalem to enable them to enter the city. If an Essene came to a painted gate, he would have to turn back. 
the Essene order held ancient documents and traditions about which strict silence was kept. Members were allowed to teach only what they had learned within the order. Anyone joining the order had to hand over all worldly possessions. The Essenes numbered four or five thousand at the time. People had come from many places in the world to live according to the order's strict rules. Any property they might have, which might be far away and Asia Minor, would be given to the order, which thus had small properties all over the place, houses, gardens, and large fields. People would only be admitted to the order if they gave their property so that it might be held in common. There was no personal property, an extraordinarily strict law in present-day terms, though we can see its point, was that an Essene could use the order's possessions to support anyone who is in need or heavenly burdened except members of his own family. An Essene settlement existed in Nazareth, where a property had been donated. This meant that Jesus of Nazareth knew about the Essene order, The people who were at the heart of the order had heard of the profound wisdom which had entered into the soul of Jesus of Nazareth, and a certain mood arose, especially among the most significant and wise of the Essenes. A prophetic vision had developed among them that if the world was to continue on its proper path, a specially wise soul would have to come who would be like a messiah. They had been looking out for people with great wisdom, and they were deeply moved to hear of the profound wisdom in the soul of Jesus of Nazareth. No wonder, then, that the Essenes received him into their community, though not necessarily into the order itself, but as an external member, and did not require him to go through the trials of the lower grades. In a way, even the wisest of the Essenes became trusting and were very open toward this wise young man. Jesus of Nazareth learned much, much deeper traditional Hebrew secrets from the Essenes than he ever did from the scholars who came to his father's house. He also heard some of the things he had known before when they had brought enlightenment through the Bath Kol. In short, a lively exchange of ideas took place between Jesus of Nazareth and the Essenes. From the age of twenty-four to twenty-seven and beyond, Jesus of Nazareth learned almost everything the Essene order had to offer. Anything not told to him in words would come to him in the form of clairvoyant impressions. Jesus of Nazareth gained important clairvoyant impressions within the Essene community, and a little later, at home in Nazareth, when he would dwell on the powers that had come to him, powers of which the Essenes had no idea, but which he experienced inwardly after the important talks he had with them. One of those experiences or inward impressions needs to be given special emphasis because it can throw light on the whole spiritual evolution of humanity. It was a tremendous, significant vision that came to Jesus of Nazareth when he was in transports, as it were. Following an exchange of ideas with the Essenes, the Buddha appeared to Jesus of Nazareth. And we may say that a spiritual conversation took place between them. It is one of my occult obligations to tell you this. For today we can, and indeed much, excuse me, must, touch on these important secrets in human evolution. Jesus of Nazareth heard the Buddha say more or less the following, quote, If the doctrine I have taught were to come to fulfillment, all people would have to be like the Essenes. That, however, cannot be, and here lies the error in my teaching. The Essenes, too, can only progress by setting themselves apart from the rest of humanity. Other people have to be there for them. Fulfillment of my doctrine would mean that all people become Essenes, and that cannot be. This was one significant experience Jesus of Nazareth had through his connection with the Essenes. Another experience came when Jesus of Nazareth met a young man of about the same age, 
who had also come close to the Essene order without becoming a member, though in a different way. This was John the Baptist, who was something like a lay brother within the Essene community. He wore the same clothes as the Essenes, for they would wear garments made of camel hair in winter. But for John, the, but for John, the Essene teaching had not really had not fully taken the place of the teachings of Judaism. The Essene teaching and lifestyle made a deep impression, however, and he lived among them as a lay brother, letting them stimulate and gradually inspire him so that he slowly came to be what the Gospels say he was. Jesus of Nazareth and John the Baptist would often talk to each other. One day, I know what it means simply to tell these things now, but nothing will prevent me from doing so. I know that occult obligation demands that I now speak of them. Jesus of Nazareth was in conversation with John the Baptist, and suddenly it seemed that the physical body of the Baptist had disappeared and Jesus had a vision of Elijah. This was the second major experience he had in the Essene community. There were other experiences too. For some time, Jesus of Nazareth had been able to observe that when he came to imageless Essene gates, he could not walk through them without the bitter realization that there were images on those gates after all. The spirits we have come to know as Araman and Lucifer would appear to him on either side of such a gate. Gradually he grew convinced that the Essenes' aversion to such images must have something to do with the evocation of the spiritual entities he would see on the gates as images of Lucifer and Araman. Jesus of Nazareth saw and felt this on several occasions. When you experience such things, you do not feel the need to brood on them much. They are too overwhelming. You soon know that human thoughts are not enough to enter into them deeply and come close to them. Yet those impressions not only engrave themselves deeply in the soul, they actually become part of one's inner life. You feel a strong connection with a part of your soul in which you have gathered such experiences and you feel connected with the experiences themselves, taking them with you through life. That was how Jesus of Nazareth took the images of Lucifer and Araman with him through life, having often seen them at the Essene gates. Initially, he merely realized that a mystery existed between those spirits and the Essenes. The effect this had on him affected his communication with the Essenes. They were no longer able to understand each other so well. Something lived in Jesus of Nazareth's soul that he could not talk to them about. Each time it was as if the words would not come, for his experiences at the Essene gates would stand between them. One day Jesus of Nazareth had a particularly important talk with the Essenes, discussing sublime spiritual matters. As he left the main gate of the Essene building, he met the figures he knew to be Lucifer and Araman. He saw them flee away from the gate of the Essene monastery. A question entered his soul. It was as if it was not he himself who asked the question using his intellect. But the question arose in his soul with elemental force. Quote, Where do Lucifer and Araman go? Where does their flight take them? Close quote. He knew the sanctity of the monastery had put them to flight. And the question would not let go, burning in his soul like fire. In the weeks that followed it stayed with him hour by hour, indeed minute by minute. Tomorrow we shall consider what he did because of the question that lived in his soul when he had learned from life that the old inspirations had gone, that religions and rites had been corrupted by demons, and he had heard the voice of the Bath Kol as he lay by the altar in the pagan place of worship. We shall consider what he did when he had to ask himself the meaning of the words spoken by the Bath Kol and of the other events I have related. And the question arose, quote, Where 
to Lucifer and Araman, go. Close quote.